are uh, Architecture Research Athens. Uh, we put research in our name because, as you will see, uh, we have a lot of speculative projects that somehow inform our uh, real projects that are realized. And um, also, as uh, probably you've heard, like I'm a professor in the University of uh, Thessaly, which is in the center of Greece. And we also, like uh, the other members of the office, Michalis and Stella, who is the th third partner, Stella Dauti, uh, we do a lot of uh, workshops and in postgraduate programs, also undergraduate um, studios uh, for universities uh, in, uh, in Greece. Um, we will present today the uh, question we are going to be discussing today is, has to do with coll the collective because um, uh, this is something that is uh, changing uh, now, these years, and uh, also because uh, we come from... Uh, in, in Greece, uh, the reality is that there is a very little planning so uh, everything, uh, all the cities, the structure of the cities uh, has has emerged to a very privatized project process, which you know we, we will discuss later. But for us, uh, collective is something that in a, in a time when everything tends to be privatized and individualized, and we tend to uh, be separated from the people next door. Um, I think it's a it's a question that we need to you know, to discuss and to find ways to um, uh, somehow encourage it. Uh, we will start by showing you two uh, from very small scale projects to you know, and as we go forward, the scale will uh, be wider. And uh, the first two projects are two small projects that are basically individual houses. And I'm going to uh, show this because the uh, collectivity starts from within the unit cell. So the first one is... Uh, oops, sorry. The first one is... Uh, um, both of these projects are um, have to do with this uh, typology that we love, which is a courtyard. So we think of them as two courtyards, and the courtyard is a very uh, is a typology the very uh, for, that is very common in the south of Europe and very common in especially in the Mediterranean, and it, for us it's a, I think the very basic collective space, you know, an outdoor space where you you know people connect. Uh, so the first uh, project is basically the design of a floor which is, uh, it's not actually a courtyard, but it's a renovation of a small apartment, but it, it's, we thought of the apartment as a courtyard. And uh, uh, this is the image of uh, the interior. Basically, we, uh, there was a very small budget, and we looked around, and we found that uh, all of the, there is a lot of marble in Greece, and in the marble yards, there is a lot of scrap pieces that you can find for very cheap uh, prices, and they come in all different shapes and sizes because it's basically leftovers from other uh, uh, works, and they, they were combining the, the floor to create this you know, uh, homogeneous surface where every, everything happens. So this is an image of the dining table, but you can see like there is a sofa that you, it's also used as a, as a bed. And um, so these are basically, you know, types of pieces that you find in a marble yard. Uh, when you cut out a counter from a, for a kitchen or from, for, for a bathroom, or when you create like uh, steps for, to cloud a, uh, a, la a stairway, there is a lot of pieces that are, you know, thrown away, and from all these different pieces of stone, we collected them, and we used them to create the floor. Uh, these are some images, and the in-between is filled with a terrazzo uh, filling, which creates this uh, very robust floor, and as this is a summer house, it's... Um, it's a very cool, sir, cool um, material to be, you know, in the heat. Uh, and the idea is that every program of the house is kind of sort of thought as a porous, like you can see through and you can connect. So everything happens around this courtyard, and you can uh, basically be social. Where uh, you know you can be sleeping and somebody's cooking, and you can always, you know, be together. 
So this is a concept of the house, how the the shower needs, you know, and it, you know, imagine yourself in the summer, you return from the beach, you need to shower, somebody's making food, or you need to rest. So everything somehow happens, you know, in this same courtyard, and it's a very social space. Um, these are some views of uh, the interior, uh, and this is uh, this is the only closed space, which is a an, an, an separate bedroom. But uh, again, the treatment of the door and the closet is uh, very similar, and uh, the closets are placed um, in the position where the old doors used to be. So it's a, it still is like a very porous um, uh, unit within the within the apartment. Um, the second courtyard I want to show you is a small summer house. We are constructed right now in uh, in, in an island called Salamis in in Athens, very close to Athens. Salamis is a is a very famous island because I mean I don't know if you know that from here, what you cover in history, but for us it's a very famous uh, island because you know you, there is this very famous. Uh, naval battle that happened in the ancient times. And that's the, basically the last thing you hear about this island because uh, since then it's been, it has been part of, because it's very close to Athens, uh, you don't relate it to summer holidays. So um, you have this impression of the summer islands as being this very exotic, uh, 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 you know, vacation places, uh, you know, uh, scattered all, all over the Aegean Sea. Salamis is not one of these islands. It's very close to Athens. It's almost part of Athens, and it's surrounded by a lot of industrial uses. Very, uh, There is a, very, a big naval base. So it's not the place you think of, um, you know, uh, for holidays when you talk about Salamis. Uh, so we we were very lucky to have this client that had a piece of land there. He want, they wanted to build a small vacation home, uh, and it's instead of uh, having this uh, very dramatic uh, plot of land overlooking the sea, they gave us a plot of land that basically has no context. Uh, there is it's very it's a very flat. Um, it's a very flat area, and um, there's, it's a lot of olive trees, and there are a lot of houses all around uh, that uh, have been. So, okay, if I can show, this is the this is uh, this is the house, and um, it's uh, like what I said before. There is no planning in Greece. So this is a, a, a like a sub out of the city neighborhood that, you know, the houses are, have been built a little bit without plan and then the streets are coming, being implemented and the, all the networks. And uh, also what is interesting is that because there is no planning and no housing uh, culture, housing like uh, the projects we have seen, like, you know, the, somebody comes and builds house, houses for a lot of people. Everybody builds their own house. Uh, this is a very working class, lower class um, uh, neighborhood and uh, the houses that are built around, we will see some in, uh, one, I guess, in the end of the presentation. They are built uh, sort of in a prosthetic way. So you build a room and then, you know, when you have the money, you add another room or when the family extends, you know, you build a terrace outside and so on. So it's, you can see the, the shapes are very regular. And uh, there's always a combination of open space, which is the, the white uh, shapes, and then the, the closed space where the, 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 build, the, the actual house is. So we, um, uh, our house uses the same kind of uh, mentality, but uh, in, a, in a different way. It reverses this uh, prosthetic process and creates a subtractive process, basically subtracting from a, from a building mass, the courtyard from the middle, so that gives you the, the place that is the heart of the house. Um, I'm showing this. This was a process of design that was not very linear, meaning that the client didn't know, was not very clear about what, you know, how big his house wanted had to be or what, you know, what type of house it was going to be. So there were a lot of study models that were done, exploring the, a lot of different... Um, uh, also for us, it was a tool to discuss with him, uh, you know, what is a house and uh, what do you want in your house to happen. 
this is uh, the final here. Um, but all of these were uh, were sort of very schematically solved, so as to for us to you know also bring in the you know what you are allowed to be allowed to build in sense of size in that plot, but also to discuss with the client you know types of rooms, types of uh, programs, the relation to the outside, and so on. Um, these are earlier version, variations of the house. The courtyard is always in the middle. And the interesting thing about this courtyard is that it's not just open space. It has a very, uh, uh, the house is very monolithic uh, uh, around, all around. But then inside, it, uh, the, the structural system changes and becomes very lightweight and metal. And uh, it has these uh, two rooms that are uh, totally uh, enclosed by glass. So. It's a way to use transparency in Greece, where the sun is very uh, strong and it's very warm. So, you know, if you put protect it, it, you know, it could work. But then what happens in this courtyard, it's... Uh, okay, let's see first the, the process, the, the subtractive process, like, you know, taking things out of a mass instead of always adding a room and a room and a room. So the idea is that, you, you know, first you have the main uh, open space and then Two openings that sort of uh, connect the, f the front and the, uh, the back of the plot. And then you carve out some other courtyards all around and the spaces inside the house. And uh, so this is the final plan of the house. Uh, and uh, uh, here you can see uh, how the, the courtyard works. You have these uh, two doors here and here. These are big shutter doors that you, you know, when you close them, when you open them and when you slide open all the windows of the house, the house becomes sort of, it's divided in two and then you can really work, walk through it. Uh, in the middle, you know, you can, in the night, you can maybe close those doors so you're protected and then you can leave the glass uh, panels open so the, you still live in an outdoor house, sort of. And then there is also a, possibility to use the courtyard to divide the front and the back, um, having two different uh, smaller courtyards. And these are uh, images of the model that we uh, made some year ago. Okay, in the, when you're inside the courtyard, you can walk up a staircase to a small terrace on top of the steel structure in the center, and um, diagonal views from the interior. Uh, uh, and then, in the end, in the, on the other side, as you come out, there is a small uh, pool. Uh, uh, the plot is very small. Like the, this pencil line you see is the, basically the border of the plot. So it's a very small um, uh, house. And um, this is another image. And uh, these are some. Uh, I brought two pictures. Just to, uh, this is under construction right now, and we're very excited. This is the center. Uh, still, the, the 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 main spaces that meet in the courtyard. The, the this um, uh, steel uh, roof that uh, is uh, protected by the the monolithic uh, plan. And then this is uh, on top of it. When you go up, this is what you see. So uh, these are the house on the uh, on the background is uh, what I was talking about before the houses that are being built without architects but they are kind of charming and uh, I think that um, for us it's uh, it's always a good uh, we always look at how people build their houses you know on their own uh, and actually I think we have copied that idea of a flo roof floating on top of a, a base that creates this very nice space in between we have copied in another project. Uh, okay, so this was all about a courtyard and this is about, um, you know, what happens with, you know, when you have a house to design and for a, for a person that you know basically, all right, for a user that you know, but what the things cha things change when you have to deal with you know the large scale and how this housing unit connects to the city. Um, this is the this is Athens. Uh, the the white area is the um, is uh, the center of Athens, the central area. This is uh, oops, sorry. Um, so okay, this is um, this is Acropolis here. 
So this is the ancient part of the city, but now the modern city has uh, covered a vast area that is uh, only uh, limited by the mountains that are uh, around it. And uh, the way that the city was um, uh, constructed is a very, as I said, a very privatized uh, process, but bottom-up process. So basically, after the war, uh, when the city had to, uh, you know, house people coming in from, uh, you know, the desert, like the the rural areas, that there was no means to live, after you know, after the civil war and so on. So uh, the, the old houses of Athens were replaced by. Um, concrete structures, vertical ones, that are very, uh, basically they're domino structures, you know, a vertical core and floor slabs that, uh, for, for, for flats. Um, this is um, uh, a, a very modern technology, but applied in the old fabric. So you, don't, you get modernism as a technology, as concrete and you know, reinforcement bars and so on, but uh, you don't, uh, and elevator shafts, but you don't get modernism as a full re fully realized spatial, you know, um, urban uh, 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 experience. So this is a typical uh, uh, apartment building. We call it polkatikia, which is multi-residence, that's how, what it means, Polkatikia, but it's like a very special topology that you find in Greece and maybe maybe somewhere else. As you go Easter, uh, eastern, towards the east, but the idea is that uh, you have all these, um, you know, separate apartments, uh, very functional, you have a designated space for a kitchen, designated space for a bathroom, designated space for a living room, for a small working space, for a bedroom, you know, this is very functional, the floor plan, and has, it has, um, and then of course you have uh, the, you know, the, the the vertical stuff making everything possible, connecting the the, the, the flats to the city fabric. Uh, the thing is that the the model of this um, uh, this this housing model is for the single family, the the, the family, which is basically a woman, a man, and two kids. So it's a it's a very you know old fifties idea. This is a, like a, a typical apartment building from the sixties, and uh, today this has been this has proved a little bit obsolete because you know families change, uh, people have moved out to the suburbs, so a lot of buildings have become vacant. And uh, there is also a lot of new uh, developments, uh, technological developments. For example, you know, you've heard of the Airbnb that you know is changing city centers all around the world. And this is uh, what has happened in nothing. Also, like the, all these empty apartments are radically reprogrammed to um, find a, rela a direct relationship to the city now, not uh, as a very private space, but they become more open and more kind of uh, public. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the next two projects I'm, I'm, I will show, discuss this uh, new Polkatikia model. One is a renovation of an existing apartment and one is a new Polkatikia that we designed in Athens. That's uh, discussing a little bit the connection of um, how, how uh, this closed unit of the apartment can open up a little bit. Um, so this is uh, uh, the floor plan of one of those uh, residential flats that was uh, from the 50s, this building. And uh, it was a house of our client. This is the house where he, he grew up, a very bourgeois, um, uh, more prominent apartment building in Athens. Uh, but then his family um, moved to the suburbs and then this apartment got a little bit uh, neglected. but. Recently, he wanted to return, but not to live, but to work there. So this is a way that these all residential apartments are kind of changing program in in, uh, in the city and can change program and how you know you can have this uh, adaptation of a of a previously totally private space and. Um, 
Uh, what I really like about these apartments is that although they, we think of them as being recent and modern, they have all this. Uh, they have a very rich material palette that is uh, not easy to find nowadays, and it's very expensive to have it. You have these amazing terrazzo floors and marble floors that are, you know, that was the way to build then. But now to make it new is very, it's very difficult and almost impossible. But we, that apartment was full of these. Materials, and we wanted to. The idea was to preserve all this uh, atmosphere of the old ap residential apartment, and not lose. I mean, even though that, even though that it will function as a working space, we didn't want to use this um, uh, this home. Uh, the idea of the home, let's say. And uh, more, more importantly, this is a notary office, which is basically a very public function because it uh, also houses the archives of contracts and public documents that are, you know, they're very, they belong to the state basically. So this is, uh, there's a lot of people coming in and out of that uh, daily. Uh, it's a very lively space, uh, even though now it looks empty. But this is, um, if we go back. This is what the only thing we did was to take down a small part of the walls to bring together the different floor patterns, and this is uh, where it happens. So it's a very mini a very minimal intervention within the structure of the house that preserves itself, but in a totally new way. And okay, this partition is like the. Uh, something that uh, is a reception. There is something, it's a space where you can walk in, somebody will say, you know, who do you want to speak to? Uh, and this is uh, the connection of the different floor materials that we that were not before possible. And all the decorations of the apartment were kept uh, in place. Um, I'm going to go through these. These are images from the, and it's a third generation notary uh, public. So these are the <laughs> previous generations on the wall, um, and the, these uh, wooden cabinets are basically the archives, which is a, the, where the, all the they are dispersed throughout. Instead of you know hiding the archive in a separate room, we decided to open to to disperse it throughout the the space, and it becomes. Uh, you know, a, a structural system because you see it everywhere. And uh, okay, and this is uh, basically the last image of this small project. And I am showing this because usually before we think we're thinking of the apartment as a, like a totally empty shell that uh, the person that would live there would bring their own furniture to you know fill it up. Uh, but now this intervention was more about creating. Um, uh, these intervent interventions that are in a scale between a furniture and the building. So it's like um, uh, another scale of, uh, uh, a larger scale of furniture, let's say, that happened there. Uh, okay, so, and now the second project uh, in this uh, uh, topic is, um, the, is a new basically a new polkatechia. Uh, that we built in Athens um, uh, a few years ago. So, okay, again, this is uh, another closer look in how Athens looks like from above. Uh, you have to imagine that all these are separate apartment buildings, polykatechias, and they, the street uh, fabric was existing before the war, and it was uh, basically uh, single-family houses. But then, when the reconstruction happened, they were replaced in the same city fabric, you know, the much denser and taller buildings. So now it's a very, it's a very, there are neighborhoods that are very dense, very, um, uh, you know, people, you know, if you ask a person from Athens, they say, you know, my city is totally concrete, there's no uh, open space. Uh, I want to just to show that uh, the, we're talking about um, uh, these are closed b urban blocks, and in, inside the, what is left is like a, the possibility of a green space, but you have no conception of it when you're walking on the street. So when you walk on the street, it's like these very narrow streets. I mean, it's a very, I, I really like, uh, you know, the, it has some very positive quality because Athens, I don't know if you've been, it's a very lively city, it's very exciting. But it is like, tot 
you're always, you know, there's always, um, you're always kind of enclosed. There's not a lot of uh, open space. Uh, so what we did was, uh, of course, yeah, okay, you saw that blue thing was our lot. Uh, what we did was, because it's a very small lot and uh, it was going to be a vertical structure, we wanted uh, a very small, a very simple L shape to leave a garden on the back. And then um, we wanted to create this porosity that was very straightforward and that would connect the street to the garden on the back, our own garden, but also the larger garden that uh, somehow uh, is in the center of the urban block. Um, so, and then there was a, a, a mixture of programs also, so it was like different housing types inside, uh, a, a housing, a, a, like a multi-story house on the top, an apartment and a working space on the bottom, so it's also a, a little bit, a mixture of um, typologies within the building. And uh, this is how the buildings look like. And this is when it's open. So on the, on the left side, there is a, a series of uh, you know, porous spaces that connect to the back of the uh, uh, to the lot. On the ground floor, it's a pilotis where you can park. The second floor is a, a living room that, with a balcony. Above there is a bedroom space that is a little bit recessed and has an open space, but you know, recessed in the uh, mass of the building. And then on top of there is a terrace, open terrace with a pergola. And uh, so this happens on the on the left side, but on the on the um, on the other on the other the rest of the facade is. Um, is a different treatment. We wanted it to be able to be totally solid, but also uh, have a direct relation to the street. So that's why we chose the vertical window where you can have a larger, in a very small distance, because the street is very narrow, you can have a direct view of the street. Uh, and then those panels a little bit uh, animate the facade and you know they bring the presence of the user uh, you know, on the facade of the building. So this is a, uh, we will see how it works with the buildings next door because it's a totally different treatment. Uh, going inside, this, there is this uh, very uh, vibrant color that uh, is basically the color of the courtyard that comes all the way to the front. So it's a way to say, you know, you know look through the building and it's true that uh, people are stopping, you know, in the beginning they were stopping back to look at the garden on the back, which hasn't really been, uh, now it's really flourishing, but that was when it was planted. And... Uh, Going inside, there is on the on the right is the entrance to the working space and the and the entrance to the rest of the houses uh, above, on in, in front of you. And this is the courtyard. It's a very vertical space, of course. Um, and this is the working space uh, on the bottom next to the entrance, a double height space. Um, all spaces connect somehow to these gardens because of the L shape. And uh, the floor plan, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's maybe a different scale from what you're used to, but this is a scale of a building lot in central Athens. That you don't get this very big uh, uh, space where you can really, uh, you know, unfold a very ambitious housing uh, scheme, but it's uh, it's a it's a scale that you can really uh, make a lot of uh, with very subtle um, um, choices or uh, ideas, let's say. So on the there is always this part of the floor plan that you know this is the opening to the center courtyard. So this is always kept free and all the other all the uses are you know pushed to the right side and it's nice because this uh, there's a woman living here 
on one of the balconies and she was really uh, thanking us for the garden that she has every morning to see. So it's a very nice um, thing to think about because building in Athens is also very neighboring. Uh, you have to deal with the neighbors a lot. You know, you have to uh, make sure that they, you know, you, you don't harass them with, you know, construction machines and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a very... People are, uh, you know, always uh, connecting. You know, it's, so it's a, it's, that complicates things. Uh, so you have to take them into, that's what I'm trying to say, you have to take them into consideration uh, in a personal level. Um, going up, again, all the, the open spaces on the right uh, and the top floor. Very simple. Uh, this is, uh, so this is a section that shows this uh, thin part of the building that uh, negotiates the street and the, the garden on the back. Some photos from the interior, and this you get a little bit of context how the buildings across the street and how close the street next uh, uh, opposite from us is. And this uh, we'll see it a little bit um, in uh, next. Okay, the, behind these uh, homogeneous win these windows that are everywhere, there's a lot of different things happening. Um, and this is how the flat, I wanted to, to show this picture because you get the, 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 the idea of the street, uh, you get the, 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 the flat treatment of the facade and the window directly on, against the street. And then in, in contrast to the old apartment buildings what that, there is always this balcony going around them, which uh, on the one hand is very uh, typical of Athens and it gives this very vibrant uh, urban fabric because people put out a lot of things and uh, it's I like it a lot but at the same time it really cuts the window the relationship from the window to the street so you when you're looking up you see balconies but you never see you know a window so we wanted to bring the window uh, you know to relate the window back to the to the street and uh, so this was uh, I think I covered my part. So Michalis is going to continue with the the, the next project. Um, so I think that um, we're going to move up again in scale. And um, I think around uh, 2013 uh, we were looking to do a a, a European competition project. And uh, we were thinking about a lot, of, a lot of the issues that Yorgos presented, like uh, urban density and how you deal with your neighbors. Uh, and um, uh, also in uh, uh, 2013, I think it was a very interesting time in Greece because we were very much in the middle of this um, economic and political crisis, um, which I'm sure you've heard a, a lot about. And um, we... Um, being uh, Greeks and looking for a site uh, in one of the many European sites that they have all, all over Europe, and you know you can choose, uh, we decided why not go directly to Germany and try to uh, make a, uh, a proposition there as kind of the, the, the bad child of Europe, um, <laughs> trying to go and uh, maybe see how we could export some of our ideas uh, about the neighborhood and how you relate to the level of the street and um, maybe even bring a little bit of the idea of a, um, a lively Mediterranean city to a German context. Um, I think, um, and of course now, now we're in Nuremberg, so it's, uh, it's interesting because for um, us, one of our experiences of visiting a German city is that they're very boring, and they always seem incredibly empty, and so um, uh, this is maybe a little bit of a generalization, but I think um, it's, uh, it was, um, I think, an explicit part of the competition uh, brief that um, uh, one of the things that had to be created in this new housing block um, was a more lively relationship to uh, the neighborhood, and uh, um, there had to be uh, a number of outdoor open spaces integrated into the apartments. This is, again, something that we associate with a Mediterranean climate um, more than a, a, a northern European climate, 
but um, that nevertheless is beginning to be a very important aspect of real estate development and how you bring a, an outdoor space into each private space. And so uh, immediately this becomes also a question of uh, relationship of the private space to the collective space or to the public space beyond. Um, so this, uh, I should s start by saying, is um, it, it's just outside of the medieval center of Nuremberg um, to the south. It's in a neighborhood that has a, a large immigrant population. Um, there's a high demand for housing, and the neighborhood is already experiencing um, uh, uh, rising prices. So part of the goal of the competition was to make a housing project that would re uh, answer the demand and therefore uh, create more housing and lower a little bit the prices. And part of the way that's done is by uh, mixing uh, private uh, for sale residences, but also so social housing that is, um, uh, f um, uh, what do you call it, supported by the state. So um, we decided that uh, here you can see in the middle the, whoop, yes, the site is there. Um, the, the kind of urban development you have there are, has a lot of green space, uh, which is um, uh, something new, but it's not always very organized. Uh, green space and open space. Um, we decided that the best strategy is to keep the traditional perimeter block, uh, both for the way that uh, the building mass reinforces uh, the, the street uh, and uh, interacts with the street, and also because it leaves the majority of clean space in the center for the potential future densification. So we have a perimeter block, and then uh, it, um, recedes at the northern end in order to create a public uh, square um, in a location that makes sense on the outside. So you, you uh, already have a, a hierarchy of spaces from outdoor public spaces to interior collective spaces that are uh, more privately used. And then there are these uh, meeting points that also bridge the inside and the outside. Uh, and this uh, was a very um, important part of our um, concept because for us, uh, we named the project uh, Meet Thy Neighbor. It's again a way of creating um, opportunities to meet uh, the people that you're living with uh, or next to. Um, and then this led to the, uh, a, um, a series of five different housing typologies. So um, par I think... Um, one of the interesting things for us was to create five different things, like five different buildings or a collection of different buildings, which was much more exciting for us than creating the same thing going all the way around the block. Um, I think that the jury considered this to be um, ambitious. We thought it made sense. Um, but anyway, we'll, we can come back to that later. Um, I think that um, it, it's a very contemporary problem how you can take many different components that you have in the built environment and create one synthetic idea around them. So I think that that's a, a theme that I think a lot of architects are working on, and I think that we also try to do it uh, in our own way. So the five different housing typologies um, are ultimately based on their relationship to outdoor space. So um, there, we have a, okay, so maybe I'll just come over here. I think that <laughs> the tower, so you have a tower that has these outdoor balconies that are recessed into the volume of the building, and then you have this typology, which is a, a two-level, uh, or actually a three-level uh, duplex um, that has a, a street entrance on the one side and it has a garden level on the back and the garden level um, also becomes part of the main interior courtyard uh, for the for the project um, it it cultivates the the intimate scale of the street on that side of the project um, 
and then you have this typology, which has a, a set of winter gardens. It's a south-facing typology. So here the balconies are enclosed in glass because that makes sense in a cold climate uh, as you have in Nuremberg. Uh, at the top, on the right, there is uh, a series of um, circulation paths uh, that uh, are combined with a, a glass screen that shelter from the heavy traffic on that side of the uh, site. And then the, on the upper left, we have um, uh, a closed courtyard typology uh, that, uh, as you'll see, can have a more flexible relationship to its users in the way that different residents um, combine either an entire floor or separate apartments. So there are different kind of bioclimatic uh, approaches that uh, sort of give an identity to each um, typology. So uh, of course there are also social aspects to this as well because the tower, for example, uh, has a very small footprint. Um, there are about 40 square meters per, for each apartment, um, unless they're combined into 80 square meters. They're, they could be suitable for a younger um, individual or uh, a, even an older person who um, perhaps would enjoy the view but doesn't want necessarily to have the uh, work of living on the ground floor or the uh, tending to a garden. And then you have these uh, duplexes that I mentioned before that are um, uh, really offer a kind of flexible idea of um, how to use part of the space um, as, a, as a professional space. For, for example, on the ground floor, on the side of the street, you can have a small office and then separate the, less, the rest of your living space above. And uh, I can also say that the, the plans are deliberately abstract, so one of the ideas that we were um, thinking a lot about is the, um, is the idea of the neutral room. Uh, it's something that um, gives us the idea that um, you can take over a room in a way that is flexible and use it in the way that you want, because uh, as Jorgos mentioned in his reference to the kind of 50s and 60s modernism, uh, space be uh, at a certain point I think became very uh, tailored to very specific uh, uses um, and, pro and programs, whereas it's much more of a 19th century idea that you have a set of um, neutral uh, or undefined rooms and then you kind of do what you want with them. So I think this is another idea, the neutral room that is becoming a little bit more part of the discussion in recent years and I think makes a lot of sense in a lot of uh, housing projects where still, still people would like to have the opportunity to uh, um, use the space in a different way. It's also a very German idea. Uh, Raum was prefer, uh, referred to by uh, Adolf Loos uh, as not only the idea of a room, but just the idea of abstract space. Uh, so it kind of has this dual um, sense. And I think when one of the things we do a lot is we really make models uh, in our projects and we deliberately avoid uh, more specific uh, um, representations of space sometimes because I think this becomes a very important strategy to allow the project to develop in phases because sometimes you have really this pressure that you have to show from the very beginning of the project and in a very short time exactly what material is going to go here and what material is going to go there. And I think it's a very, um, the wrong way to allow a project to develop. So um, part of the, our focus on models as a form of representation is really about uh, remaining faithful to the idea of organization and uh, the kind of you know, um, basic relationships that are important to us before we decide what colors uh, is going to be the stucco. Um, and here you see the uh, plan with the, with the winter gardens on the south side of the site. So that's another um, advantage to saying that you're going to work with a collection of different component, uh, components or a community of five different buildings because it lets you be much more uh, versatile to the way that you respond to the specific conditions of the site because it's, it's very different going all the way around. I didn't say anything about this, I guess, but you can see what it is. And it's kind of also the idea that um, 
a single floor can potentially be co-opted by an entire community uh, as uh, for an old person's community or for a different kind of social um, format that would not necessarily correspond to the idea of one traditional family for one uh, apartment. And this is the side of the street with a lot of noise. So there, um, there are filters. There's a, a circulation wall with stairs and pathways uh, and a, a, a glass barrier for noise deduction. Um, and then we could also say that there, there are categories of space, like the balcony that looks onto the main interior courtyard. That's a collective courtyard in the center of the project. So again, there, there are huge there's a huge number of um, different uh, apartment typologies which are based only on uh, changing the relationship between uh, the main access, circulation access, uh, and the type of outdoor space, whether it's a garden or a terrace or a balcony, um, and, uh, and, and the leftover space, uh, everything else that we regard as, as rather neutral. And this is the, the public square on the north end. And then these are some of the spaces that are kind of incorporated into the building as these public meeting points. That they're, on the one hand, they're bridges that allow you entry into the uh, interior of the project. And uh, on the other hand, they're combined with public programs at the ground level, which only makes sense to kind of um, uh, create a um, a kind of life on the street. And there's this osmosis uh, inside and outside. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, you have this uh, maximum space in the middle, which is the... Um, uh, it's not uncommon in, in many places like uh, uh, this part of Germany, but where you have a, 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 com a garden in common where you can have different uh, areas that you work, cultivate in different ways, or uh, that you can use as space to expand the build area um, in the future. Um, and for us, it was also kind of an, we uh, included a kind of participatory aspect of the way that the residents would be able to kind of use the space in different ways, um, depending on their wishes uh, in the future. So I think that the, um, there was a process that followed with the, um, with the municipality of presenting uh, a, um, some iterations of the work with the local residents. Um, this was important because obviously the, the uh, uh, designing for collective space is not just a matter of, of course, of the design, but it's also a, a, an issue of public dialogue, um, which is something that we've also worked on a lot through uh, public workshops and ideas of participatory planning, uh, which our office does, but here we won't really present more of that. Um, So I think that uh, this um, I think that this was an important uh, experience for us, and it was a way that we could uh, present our ideas in a, a completely different context, which I think is also is always healthy um, for an architect. Um, uh, as mentioned before, I think it was uh, it did receive a, um, an honorable mention um, in the Europe European, but it was considered a little bit. Um, um, ambitious, I believe, and ultimately they did go with another um, plan uh, that was a, a much more um, a, a ring typology uh, with a kind of a, the same um, uh, housing uh, module going all the way around. It's a kind of a very German thing. I don't know why that happened. But so then we decided to do another European in uh, 2015, and we went uh, back to the south. So this time we were dealing with a small fishing village in Portugal, which was uh, very um, close to what we identify with in Greece, um, both because Portugal is a setting that um, has a lot to do uh, with tourism. It's an economy that's really dependent on tourism, uh, and because of the physical setting uh, of being on the coast. So you see a very small town that um, 
is um, was once prosperous, but now it's very poor. And uh, it's really between the sea and the land. And it had a number of houses. Um, uh, now the residents are around 200. Uh, what is remarkable about the site is that there are a lot of empty lots everywhere. So even though it's kind of from high above, it looks as though it's a complete town, um, it's really lacking a lot of density and it has all the infrastructure. So it has sidewalks and streetlights, but then there's this problem of vacancy because the economy doesn't have anywhere to stand. So here the problem of density is quite different than it was in Nuremberg. I think in Nuremberg it was a kind of economic issue and one that uh, was aimed to try to lower the cost of housing in that neighborhood. And here is an issue of basic uh, liveliness to um, make the town sustainable, so to bring people back. In Nuremberg there were too many people in the neighborhood um, and here there were not enough. So um, with the lack of resources, the first thing that we uh, noted is that this is a very amphibian con uh, condition, and that's why we call the project Amphibia. So it's between the sea and the, uh, and the maritime industry um, with a very strong fishing uh, tradition and also the collection of seaweed uh, and other activities that are based in the water. And then on the other hand, uh, agricultural um, uh, um, land uh, to the east. And then running through it is a very ancient path. It's called the Rota Vicentina, uh, which is, uh, it runs the entire length of the, um, the lower half of Portugal along the coast. So there are a lot of hikers and, you know, there is this activity that runs through the site. So with a lack of other resources, we, for, we turned first to uh, the residents and said that, okay, there are human resources in a way, and what are their basic roles? So they, they have their farmers. Did I change something? Okay. They have their farmers, they have fishermen, they have hikers, uh, they have a few scientists studying the marine biology, uh, and a few, and, 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 uh, and a few others, and we said that the first thing was to take these traditional identities and to make them into hybrids. So, um, uh, uh, amphibia comes from the Greek word for living in both land and water, and also we feel that the residents can play two roles. So, uh, a fisherman can also become a tour guide, uh, and um, uh, a scientist can also become a resident, and a homemaker can also um, offer um, um, various produced goods or um, uh, uh, host uh, visitors. So there are all these, you know, the one idea is to map the town according to its people, its products, and its places, uh, and its goods. So this is kind of a, a projection of the ways that the economy could work from the existing to create new connections and new kinds of hybrids. And then the part of the um, brief involves the um, densification at the same time. So the actual housing units that are introduced are designed to be able to, uh, each unit can densify over time at the same time that these hybrid programmatic activities are um, allowed to exist. So in a way we had the idea of the, I'm afraid to touch this button again. Here, okay, so you saw the lower left of the slide. It's like a, it's a long um, monte, is the traditional kind of uh, uh, house in Portugal. Uh, here the idea of the courtyard is a large space at the ground floor um, where you can have a hammock rental or, um, and then you have these uh, work, a combination of workspaces and residential spaces that make up these blocks that uh, fill in the rest of the Monte uh, typology. And so, of course, this is a very flexible idea of how you put a house together. Um, but it, it, it's a designed process that follows an observation of what people actually do 
Um, it's simply designed in a more architectural way, uh, I guess you could say. And then there are these relationships uh, to, the, to the yard and to the street um, and the way that that passes through the house. And so again, it's uh, cultivating this uh, flexibility and a porosity. And then this is how the town, uh, if we go back, starts as very, very few inserts at the beginning. And then uh, uh, the public uh, uh, front along the sea is a little bit reinforced with a few public uh, buildings. And then more uh, residential um, units are applied and it kind of grows. So it's uh, something like this has to happen over time. So one of the m most important things that uh, we think that uh, architects deal with today is kind of like the, the way you address the issue of time. Um, so it's uh, time planning and not only space, space planning. Um, and there are other things that we could say too, like about the way that you have these, um, these narrow streets that's actually an existing uh, system of alleys that run through the town because the fishermen when they have to go to the coast and they have a, a, another area for their boats and their nets, when they come back, uh, they, they pull their equipment and they don't pull it through the street, they pull it through these narrow alleys and they enter through the back of the house. So it's kind of, um, it's part of uh, something that arises from a particular programmatic and a very local need, but that then, can certainly be redeveloped as something that is a very nice system of pedestrian uh, uh, networks. And we'll refer to that again. So here's a drawing we made of the total um, plan. It's a drawing that, among other things, is nice because it combines uh, existing um, elements and new elements in a single format. So it's kind of saying that both are equally important. Um, this also received, a, what do you call it, um, an honorable mention. So then we have a, a few um, moments of what were important um, uh, aspects of kind of some of the programmatic um, hybrids that exist in the town, like the one on the left is about a, a, a garden where you can go and buy a hammock, and the hammock will be made from the disused um, fishing nets, which are repaired using the special knowledge of the uh, local uh, women in the town who know how to uh, use the knots and the, the nets. So, these proposals are really based on observations of knowledge that actually exist um, there in the town and it's trying to think of new things to do with that knowledge. So to create a new kind of uh, service uh, and tourist economy, uh, but one that's sustainable both for the locals as well as for people who will visit. Um, And then here on the right, you see uh, one of the paths that I uh, alluded to before, um, uh, which becomes a new uh, circulation network for people who will stay there uh, in a kind of on a temporary basis, either because they're hikers or tourists um, to this uh, region, um, but that uh, creates a kind of uh, uh, an opportunity for um, a local resident or a temporary resident or an even short, more short-term resident to interact. Okay. Can... <laughs> Thank you. So the last project that we're gonna show now, I hope we haven't gone too much over time, um, is kind of a dessert. It's, um, <laughs> It's a fiction. Uh, we were invited by the curators of the Tomorrow's um, exhibition in Athens, um, supported by the Onassis Cultural Foundation, to make a, a project or an installation about the future of the Mediterranean city. Um, 
We, so this, it's, um, with a little bit of patience, you, you'll see that it also has an, uh, a very important aspect of housing uh, as part of this um, material. Um, for us, in thinking about the future of the Mediterranean city, uh, it was again uh, important, um, this idea that Greece is on the periphery of uh, a very technocratic um, uh, European context. And so part of our idea about the future was, uh, began with observations about what's happening now in Greece. Um, so on the one hand, we created something um, that is the technocratic uh, state of the future. It's a kind of neoliberal paradise that we call the transparent state. And then everything that's left over is the housing fabric of the previous city. Um, and it's, uh, it, it remains as a set of what we call shelters. So they're shelters which are live-in factories where future citizens can put together their own post-capitalist uh, um, economy. So I know that none of that makes any sense right now, so I'm just going to keep going, and maybe it will later. Um, the site that we chose to focus on is called Victoria Square. It's uh, in the center of Athens. It's an old bourgeois neighborhood, which is now very economically um, uh, disadvantaged, um, especially in the last 15 years, there was a, a very large scale movement from the center to the uh, suburbs of Athens, and a lot of these old neighborhoods became empty and the prices dropped and they became inhabited, uh, especially by newly arriving immigrants. So Victoria Square is a very, um, for some it's a symbolic gateway to Europe. For many uh, of the refugees who are fleeing uh, from the Middle East. Many of them are aware of Victoria Square, even though they know very little about the rest of Athens or, or of Greece. Um, there was a very important political um, moment in 2015 when the refugees occupied the square um, in tents and they stayed there. And that kind of a little bit characterized this place for, in the minds of many um, Greek residents. And so here you see the center of the square. Um, and um, another kind of important myth about the square, um, uh, I uh, mentioned that the, the refugees and the occupation, it's also the way that the politicians sort of ca characterize the refugees as sunbathing. Um, when they occupied, this, uh, occupied the square, which is, of course, very controversial, and it's kind of, to us, it sort of brought up a lot of questions about the nature of temporary habitation and also the idea of leisure. Um, and, uh, in, in, as a, 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 and leisure activities in public space, so that also became important to us. And then there's also the statue of uh, Theseus, um, who in Greek mythology is the, related to the idea of the labyrinth. So the square for us um, is important as a public space because one of our primary observations is that pu public space is becoming more and more fortified. Um, uh, there are, um, we were thinking a lot about the plans to um, protect the Eiffel Tower behind a glass barricade. Um, this is the privatization of public space and the fortification of public space for security reasons is, I think, something that more and more characterizes every public space in Europe. And at the same time, uh, private space is becoming more public. So the way that apartments are used and, and housing is uh, reappropriated uh, uh, currently it makes private space and the idea of the interior much more important for the way that it opens immediately to um, uh, public use. So um, before we go to the idea of the um, of the, the housing. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly go through this, um, the space of the square, which like the Tony Paxton's Crystal Palace has become a new uh, uh, kind of uh, glass structure that is, um, uh, that we call the embassy. 
So here is the embassy, and it's the place where everyone who wants to gain access to the transparent state of the future um, has to move through. So it's based on the future, uh, the typology of the control room. There are checkpoints, control rooms. These are very polemical typologies that in the history of architecture have a, a very uh, well-developed history. For us, the embassy is one of these uh, uh, um, uh, places where uh, you have a very long wait to move through a very complicated series in order to work your way through the tr uh, to gain access to this transparent state, which is then, you know, it's, an, it's a network that expands, um, it extends throughout Europe, it's borderless, but to get there you have to give up your right to security. So you don't, or you have to give up your right to privacy, rather, in order to gain access to the, the security of the uh, of this uh, space. So, it's also a space that's sort of designed to be constantly in movement and constantly uh, to, to offer a set of uh, prepared experiences because that's also a thing that characterizes public space. These days, there's a very constructed idea of how you move and what your experiences are. It's a way in which um, the individual has to become docile in order to be granted access, um, docile or passive. And in the background, we can see an example of one of the shelters. So the shelter is the, what remains of the previous Policatiquies. Um, it's only a shell. Um, and the way that it's inhabited uh, becomes both a space of residence and the space of production. So there are no more resources if you don't live in the transparent state. So you have to kind of come up with your own social network. Um, or smart city in order to find a way to survive in this post-capitalist society. So it's not so much about uh, the smart city as a technocratic space, but more about the smart city as who you know. So how, how you can cooperate or find new forms of collaboration uh, to create value uh, within this uh, future network. This is, a, an, uh, this is a picture of the installation in Athens. Now the installation is in Nantes in France. Um, you can see that there are, there's the main model of the uh, Victoria Square in the middle, and then there are four models around it. So each of the four models is a specific building taking, taken from the uh, perimeter of the square, and each represents uh, each one of the four shelters represents a different kind of uh, private space that replaces the democratic institutions that uh, no longer have a place in the future. So these, what are these democratic institutions? One is the idea of the school, another is the idea of the art museum, another is the idea of the hospital, uh, and then we have something called the symposium. So within these frameworks, here is one. Uh, you have these live-in spaces. So this, this one here is called the symposium. Um, in, the, in the future, every, everything that used to be the humanities, so art, philosophy, and history, uh, no longer has any value. Um, but what does have value are the kind of social solidarity networks that you need to live. So this is the Los Lounge, and it reminds us that Los said that all you need to make uh, a home into a dwelling is five rugs, one to cover the floor and four for the walls. And so here you can also enjoy a Nargal pipe or a cup of tea. Then there's something called the sacred bar, uh, because it's the kind of, um, when you don't have money to pay a, a high-paid psychologist, you come and you hang out with your friends here, and that's a sacred bar because you really need this in order to, to, to feel well. And then there's a, there's a community kitchen that serves the entire shelter. There's the Dionysos Terras, which uh, takes advantage of global warming so you can enjoy some of the hot 
wet, even more hot weather um, on the roof um, and work on your serotonin. Then there's something called the School of Amateurs. So the amateur is like a, a very major uh, characterization of, uh, of, of people in the future. So we're all amateurs. And it's the idea of the open university um, where there's a... Um, uh, you stay, but you have to teach people your own private knowledge in exchange for goods. So you can you live there, and while you live there temporarily, um, you um, you basically teach e e each other uh, all that you know. And so it becomes a constantly rotating uh, uh, kind of uh, educational network here, and. It kind of reminds us of the, the Greek philosopher Heraklitos, who said that you can never step into the same river twice, and here you can never step into the same school twice. So it's also a, I won't go into the design aspects of what, you know, how you um, actually live there or, you know, where you're sleeping and keeping your stuff, but it's a constantly ro rotating uh, residential structure. And then we have the uh, factory of useless objects. Um, what used to be the museum um, no longer has any value, of course, um, and uh, the transparent state of the future is all about utilitarianism, whereas we would prefer to think of the preface of Oscar Wilde's uh, Portrait of Dorian Gray, where he says that all art is quite useless. So uh, the idea of the factory of useless objects is that people will spend their time archiving uh, raw material uh, and transforming it into objects whose only value is based on uh, the degree to which the objects generate discussion. So uh, this, of course, is not a, a neoliberal um, uh, value in any sense, but it's something that uh, works um, in the autonomous realm of the factory of useless objects. So here, people are making things, and they're also living in these shelves. And then they gather at the, at the central stairwell to discuss their, uh, their objects and uh, before they're recycled into the system. And so, um, and then the last one is the heroic medicine shelter. Uh, heroic medicine, um, is something that existed in, in North America when the, well, there's a large immigration from Europe at the beginning of the 20th century to North America, and the, uh, the new arrivals of immigrants would often be sick or, or have various illnesses from the journey, which is very difficult. So the, the immigrants who had already arrived would set up their own shelters uh, as informal doctors. So of course, they have a tra traditional knowledge and, uh, with, that they carry with them and that they would use to then nurse the new, uh, newly arrived immigrants back to health. So the idea is that no one is going to have money for health insurance in the future. So here is the uh, residential shelter where uh, people can nurse each other back to health. So there are different, um, there, are, there are four different uh, categories from the phlegmatic to the choleric to the sanguine to the, I can't remember the other category, but never mind, we can keep moving, um, that uh, based on this um, ancient Greek, uh, analysis of the kind of uh, physiochemistry that in each individual has, and therefore uh, the personality type that each individual has, you can be directed to the kind of uh, cluster that most suits your problem uh, or other ailment. So um, if you're phlegmatic, then it would be good to visit the Chinese uh, medicines counter, or it could just mean that you need to do more yoga, or uh, that you need to rely on uh, traditional stretching techniques, um, but that there are all kinds of ways that we, uh, and indeed in Greece, 
uh, throughout the most difficult years of the crisis, that there were many solidarity networks that were um, set up that tried to go around the state system when the state doesn't have any more res resources. So it's kind of about this way that social solidarity is kind of the, uh, a very important aspect of living in, in cities uh, and probably the most important um, form of collectivity. So um, I think in ending, um, uh, someone made the comment that uh, your models really look like Vic Victorian dollhouses, which sounds a little bit offensive at first, but then it's also a very, I think in the end it's a very um, interesting comment that we like um, for several reasons. Um, one is that it reminds us of the idea of the 19th century novel, um, and we had done a, a little bit of reading about the Bakhtin, if you're familiar with Bakhtin, and he's talking very much about the way that um, that uh, um, the, the, the character who uh, has a powerful presence in the 19th century novel um, is the one that is constantly transforming as opposed to um, only fixed. Um, and he's also um, um, advocating for something called this heteroglossia, where people are speaking different languages and there's a kind of like richness and of collective ideas that we also seek overall to incorporate into our work. Um, whether it's a collection of buildings or a collection of communities or a collection of uh, programs that make into a, a single synthesis. Um, but then there's also the idea that um, uh, an architectural project can sometimes be like a novel because you think of a framework that is like a story, but then you can always think of other stories that come and supplement. So this project for us continues to produce these kind of ideas of different scenarios. It's a starting point, but then you know the different shelters are like chapters in a book, so you can think of new chapters that uh, can take your work further in the future. And then I think that um, Finally, it's the idea that the, um, the residential interior is one of the most important sites of collective space today. Um, the unit of the room and the, di the direct relationship of the room to the city, um, whether it's through new or recent mechanisms like Airbnb or through digital platforms or whether it's directly through the kinds of architecture that uh, are constantly trying to foreground things like autonomy, individuality, uh, access, transparency. They're all about creating particular connections between the individual and the individual living space. And it's sort of everything in between that we would like to take apart and develop more so that there, there, it's a more blurry space between the private space and the public space. So I think that at the end, to say that the, uh, the hermetically closed interior of the Victorian dollhouse um, is maybe where we once were 100 years ago. Maybe now is the time where that you really have to find all the different ways that that can open up. Um, so I hope that that made sense. Um, do we have anything else to say? OK, I think we're finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you really for your le lecture. I really like the way how you represent your architecture and ideas, but also how you approach it and how you relate ordinary and already existing elements in a completely novel way and adding them extra value and also enabling flexibility that we spoke about yesterday. But I also noticed something idealistic in your architecture that I also really like because I read once that without utopia there is no progress. So I would love you just to reflect on that and to hear your opinion about do we need maybe more utopia to make a real step over in the realm of housing? And maybe just one <laughs> question more. Uh, have you maybe have an opportunity to apply some of these ideas of the smart city, partially maybe, in some of your project? And what is your experience about it? 
Uh, okay, first of all, uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I think that the way that uh, we grew to really think about how we our work is uh, because we had uh, we, we spent 10 years uh, uh, you know, through the crisis in Greece, and uh, it was a very, it was a little bit dark period because uh, there was not, uh, uh, there was not enough work, and a lot of uh, our, uh, you know, a lot of our friends, architects, have moved to Germany or to London or to other places where it's more prosperous. So, uh, that, but that at the same time it was dark, but it was a very creative time because we really had time to think uh, about. Um, our, you know, our profession, and um, I think that um, uh, this is this created this idea of, uh, you know, we don't, we really, at the same, I mean, I really appreciate that the, the fact that you saw something idealistic in our work, but I also think that it really comes from very pragmatic uh, uh, remarks of, you know, what exists yeah, now. No, uh, Maybe here. <laughs> yesterday, Diana from the mm. audience asked about is there anything heroistic mm. still yes. left in architecture? Mm. I think we need just to like, we are all uh, thinking about, and we need to think about real conditions, mm. but maybe sometimes we need just to like. Yes, I think it's a, I think it's a, um, it depends on you, <laughs> the, per the person you are. I think for, for me, it's uh, I don't see I, I, I don't I don't think of uh, the architect as a hero. I don't like that a little, uh, idea a lot. But I really think that the architect can be critical about uh, things that are happening around him, and he can re somehow see them in a different way and can reinvent them. Um, because uh, there's an opportunity in what the, you know, in what is around us, uh, and also the the last part of the, the presentation that uh, is uh, is not really, you know, it's actually dystopia, and I think that also has a value instead of you know trying to think of you know the future that everything is going to be perfect. I think it's uh, it's really creative to think about a dystopia that is like a really horrible future where you know you are excluded from this transparent state and you know you have to live in the shelters but this uh, dystopia allows you to uh, be critical about things that are already happening now uh, and it's uh, yeah that, that's what if you want to um, I, I'm already wearing this I would also say that there's there's an there's another answer I like that answer better but there's also a practical answer to uh, the idea of um, using representational methods that uh, are maybe non-traditional for architects. So I think part of the idea of this utopia is kind of the way that you create an image, but then the way that you create an image is so important to the way we get work done. And sometimes there's, there's these very cliche um, ways that we're expect, expected to produce renderings or drawings that in order to communicate with clients. And sometimes we still have, uh, especially developer clients who they say, okay, nice, but we have to see the, you know, the uh, uh, computer rendering. And I think that um, one of what, uh, we, what we would try to resist that where possible because I think it's important to kind of refocus the conversation on other um, aspects of a project and sometimes those are more utopian aspects but they never get discuss discussed if you're only making plans and sections and computer renderings. So I think that sometimes it's simply about the way that you choose to communicate uh, that makes the kind of uh, choice of representation very important. So um, I, th I think that that's also an aspect of, of utopias, you know, because you have to kind of look beyond what is conventional and, and, and find a way to do it. Okay, someone from the audience who maybe would love to ask something? Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> so... Okay, well, I will time. say the only word I know in Greek, avcharisto, and uh, please, after the short break, but five minutes break, We'll be here to hear Nerma, Nerma Linsberger. Okay, thank you. Thank you.